Good morning, you guys. How are you doing? Good morning. Well, what an amazing podcast. How many people actually know that this took place? And because, I mean, I, I, I've been baffled and so intrigued at the same time. Gosh, you know, it's, it's a great question because when Alex and I first started talking about this story, it's something that I had been familiar with for a number of years and always thought, uh, it was nuts how few people knew about this. So, Al Alex, I think uh, both of us have friends who were in the Marines, and they may have been educated about Smedley Butler uh, during their training. But if you ask the average person, even people who live in Smedley Butler's hometown, you would be met with a blank stare. <laughs> the plot against FDR. I mean, th this is history. And at the same time, it throws me right up in, in into uh, just a couple of years ago with Donald Trump and, and the insurrection. It's it's like this has always been going on. Yeah, the, we we were actually our, our you know, this this show took two turns to get right and to get into the, the you know, the sort of the form that. It is now the first time around. It was a, a pretty straightforward historical telling of events. But while we were working on that, the January 6th insurrection was happening. Like like Ben and I actually had a recording, like a recording session that day. Wow. Um, and so, yeah. So, you know, I, I you know, w there was definitely something in the air that made us feel like that this, this story had some legs um, and that, you know, that it was sort of relevant to the to the age we were living in but yeah this let's let's start a coup in a different form actually was in existence before all of this stuff happened I mean, it's almost like you guys were personally called to recall history because, I mean, let me look at this the way that you describe it. America was failing unemployment. Thousands of banks had failed. Oh, my God. It sounds like 2023. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of observations throughout civilization that history may not always uh, it may not always repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And if you see the same factors applying, you're going to see similar results. Uh, we you know, we hit this weird creative impasse with this, uh, as as my partner Alex said, uh, this was originally a straightforward show about a very terrifying incredibly frightening thing and we were lucky enough uh to pull in our pal joe canosian who is doing the music and it turns out joe also does a lot of amazing character voices so we said you know what let's kind of make it a dark comedy it seemed like one of the uh best ways to explore the story that so few people know without instantly i don't know what would you say alex terrifying them yeah, I mean, we just, I, I really wanted to write something that wasn't like anything else that existed anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, there there's sort of a whiff of like old time radio drama to it. And it has this sort of like vaudevillian comedy feel. But the thing that I, I sort of sort of started to imagine when we brought Joe on was like, how would Mel Brooks tell this story? Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, I, I I get that, and and you know, and that's part of. Yeah, I grew up listening to radio mystery theater, so at night, mm -hmm. that my my ears were on that radio because I could envision what was going on, and that to me is my attraction to this because I I can envision, and then and then I start believing it, and then when you talk about the comedy, it's like, well, no wonder I'm really diving into this because anything with comedy in it, all of a sudden I start believing it. Yeah, and that's that. You know, uh, I think we all really appreciate that point because. Look, if you want to communicate with people well, uh, you want to be able to have human moments with them. And that's something that we can kind of forget when we're exploring these big stories uh, throughout history. Uh, there is this human element. And, you know, call it accuse us of gallows humor if we must. But there are some very surreal moments in this story i mean if you imagine as you described arrow the 1930s the 1920s the times leading up to this we're talking about an american public that had been driven to the brink of financial extinction you know and uh there were all these people who had to radically reassess their understanding of the world and when you're in that kind of vulnerable time there are bad faith actors who can use that as an opportunity to advance their own, you know, their own nefarious goals. And Smedley Butler, 
by no means, I hope I can say this without ruffling feathers, Alex, Smedley Butler by no means was a uh, perfect guy. Yeah. Uh, he just happened to be a really hardcore, hard-nosed Marine who finally drew a line in the sand. He, he's a guy that grew into his name. I mean, to have a name like Schmedley Butler, you've got to live up to that name. And boy, he, I mean, he really jumps into this story. And all of a sudden, you know, he, I would love to sit down with other people that are listening to the podcast and see what they envision this dude to look like. And, and, and you know, because, I mean, that's what I love about podcasting is that we get to draw our own pictures. Yeah. I mean, he definitely had a massive tattoo of the Marine Corps globe and anchor <laughs> on his chest. And he had, and he had this real sort of like avian nose, like, a you know, and he was, he was small. He was like, you know, five, eight and 125 pounds or 130 pounds. Um, but he was just this, you know, tough guy who, you know, sort of against the odds came from, uh, you know, uh, an aristocratic family, um, from the Philadelphia High Line, um, and you know, like as like like a lot of you know young men his age um, fell in love with the idea of joining the military during the Spanish American War um, and quit school and you know ran away from home. His father was actually a congressman, hmm. um, and he 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 ran away from home and lied about his age to join the Marine Corps. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, like in the, the sort of the, uh, the silver spoon sort of followed him to the military. He, you know, he was never, he enlisted, but he, he, when he joined up, he landed because of his dad as an officer. Um, but yeah, I mean, and really for, for many, many years serves as the sort of, um, you know, the tip of the, the tip of the arrow for American imperialism, um, and does a lot of you know, a lot of dirty work, a lot of very questionable things um, in the name of, uh, you know, American expansionism and sort of American empire building uh, for Uncle Sam. Um, and yeah, our, our story really picks up with him on the tail end of that that part of his life. The, the, the characters that are in this story and, and the way that you bring them forward, they are of a generation that we don't see anymore. I mean, when, when you describe General Butler the way that you do, that, that generation doesn't exist anymore with that gigantic anchor and, and the way that, you know, that, 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 that uh, confidence and that courage that he carries forward. It's a completely different view of the American soil. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He's, he, he's really like, you know, he, he was the first modern Marine. Yeah. You know, like he was... And and sort of his, his his sort of vibe was the it was really the sort of template for you know the Marine Corps you know the Marine Corps vibe that we have now um, mm-hmm. yeah but that's definitely a generation that doesn't exist anymore and also also communication was changing I think too you could ask yourself um, that's that that's something that you know we we go back to when we play around a little bit with the idea of how this larger than life figure would have interacted with the modern world and it would be a, a very different landscape today what what keeps <laughs> what kept me up a little bit too late sometimes as we were working on this was the idea of oh geez what if smedley butler had twitter you know how how would that have worked out i mean he was like well the thing is is he was legit famous i mean he was yeah especially in retirement he and and he broke a lot of rules he was legit famous um one one of the scholars on our show a really bright guy named jonathan katz describes him as kind of the first troll um, you know, he's, you know, outspoken. He broke a lot of rules. Um, he spoke at a turn, you know, like he, he definitely had, you know, upon retirement had this path in front of him where he could have been a, a Senator or a Congressman, or, you know, he could have done like Douglas MacArthur did and retired to a very cushy job as the chairman of like, you know, a typewriter company mm-hmm. or, or something. And he could have lived in the penthouse at the Waldorf Astoria and he went in a completely different direction. Um, yeah, a, a definitely, you know, a singular American character. But did he know he was breaking the rules? Because, I mean, the one thing I keep hearing about today is, well, if you're convinced that you're not breaking the rules, you're not breaking the rules. So I have to ask if the general knew that he was physically breaking the rules. Yeah, there's there's a good question there. I would, I would imagine, and deferring to Alex here, who has done... A vast amount of research i would imagine that often 
uh, Major General Butler thought that the rules themselves were suspect in in many ways, uh, and therefore he he would feel like some of those rules. Uh, especially the rule of thumb, like the unspoken rules of decorum and how you're supposed to behave in the aristocratic class, he would think those are fraudulent and rules that should be broken. However, there were um, there were things that he took a very strong stance on, especially as he became increasingly an anti-war activist. Uh, he would he would tour. Uh, all across the U.S. making these barnstorming speeches, you know, this real fire and brimstone stuff about power to the people. And he would ask he would ask these uh, serious questions that a lot of people at the time would have preferred remained unasked. Like, why are why are so many young men dying? Uh, across the world, right, uh, as part of America's armed services, and what what does this really do for America versus what does it do in his mind for American companies? So he was a bit of a maverick, uh, I think, in that sense. But when it came to asking him to break some very serious rules, like uh, laws against treason, sedition, and so on. Uh, that's where he drew the line. He was definitely following the rules at that point yeah. in his mind. Were you guys shocked to re- to learn that J.P. Morgan was a part of this? Because I, I'm still in shock because I always thought he was the great white, great hope. You know what I mean? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he, um, yeah, so this is, it's weird because there's this journalist uh, named Spivak and this guy, is uh you could almost call him like a fringe journalist of the days one of the first sort of gonzo journalists who puts themselves in the story and is really forthright with their own opinions and perspective and in a series of articles uh spivak lays out what you could call an old school conspiracy board and he has this he has like mugshots basically of the um the powerful business tycoons that are in his mind all involved with the with the coup attempt and jp morgan kind of exists in the center of the web oh there God. Uh, yeah as far as surprising i don't know i mean it's surprising that these guys were usually pretty ruthless in business could team up so well, well again allegedly and I, and I think what's equally surprising is the affinity to fascism that a lot of American sort of tastemakers and tycoons and, and sort of power brokers, for example, uh, Mr. Hearst, uh, you know, um, of, of Hearst, you know, of yes. sort of the now famous Hearst publications um, was, you know, a sort of a, a, a dedicated fascist. Um, you know, we talk about that a lot in the series. Um and and so yeah, I mean, and and as we say, sort of in episode one, you know, in in 1933, when the action on the show kicks off, you know, fascism really still has this new car smell. Yeah. Um, and you know, we, I think one of the things that gets lost in history and people makes makes people really uncomfortable is that Americans for a very long time have had this affinity to to fascism. You know, it, it's been part of the American fabric for you know now for almost a century um that th- there's been this sort of long attraction to authoritarianism the podcast the podcast we're talking about is let's start a coup the plotters had men guns and money do you think that could have been one of the tripping things uh at, during the insurrection is that man they had men guns and money money was a big thing back then mm-hmm. yeah and there's the issue is that we're talking about someone who prevented something right through their actions and so maybe part of the reason the story was buried for so long uh comes down to the fact that he was successful in preventing something right so history would never know uh how things would have played out if he had said yes if he had allowed if he had consented and complied with the tycoons who were asking him to be the military figurehead of this coup uh, again, at a time where so much of the American population was quite vulnerable, uh, 
you could, I, I would posit, you could see a world in which people followed, mm -hmm. not without knowing the details about monetary policy that these business interests wanted, without knowing the specifics of their long-term goals, domestic and abroad, they would have followed a guy that they trusted because they remembered him from all of his speeches. Very scary time, and we never know how you know, how close the United States came to that precipice. Well, I invite listeners to sit down and draw out the map with each episode. And what I mean by that is, is because, I mean, you talk about how Hitler was, you know, the dictator that seemed to be inspiring. We've got we've got pro Mussolini immigrants that, that have been activated in the country. If they draw the lines and take a look at the picture of American history, they're going to go, oh, my God, right there in front of us, it was taking place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I think the funny thing for us, uh, Arrow, is uh, we were we just looked at each other over this call and nodded yes because you're absolutely right, sir. This is um, this is a kind of story that people need to remember. And while it may seem um, uh, while it's easy to draw parallels today, it's also important to remember that regardless of what your um, given political ideology might be, regardless of how you feel about the military or American actions abroad, this is a story more people need to know because knowledge is power. And so um, I think Smedley Butler would say it's the th same thing as arming yourself. Now, we talk, uh, we talk about the general, but there's another general that we need to bring in, and that's General McGuire. <laughs> but you want to take this one, Alex? Jerry, Jerry Maguire? Yeah, he was the um, he was the ham, as they would say back then. He was the ham and eggs man. He was the the, the money man, the the front for the um, the front for the sort of fascist interests that were trying to get General Butler to lead a coup against the you know against President Roosevelt. Um, Jerry Maguire became sort of I think a, a favorite character of the production team as we went through. Um, we started writing. You know, it, it was interesting how the whole sort of like character play started in this um, started in the show. It, it it's it started with these two sort of anonymous plutocrats that act as, in a way, in a strange way, kind of the Greek chorus for the show. But then Jerry Maguire very much, I think, sort of solidified and and brought what was you know was the sort of um, the template for how we treated bringing voice to people that had been dead for a century. Um, and so, yeah, Jer Jerry Maguire, um, is, was sort of, is a, is probably a bit player in the real story, but very much, I think the, you know, the, the animating life of our show, let's start a coup. Um, he's very mysterious. He, you know, he, uh, uh, um, sort of approached Smedley Butler early on about leading the coup, um, but would never say who his bosses were or the money came from. Or anything like that, um, but yeah, he's uh, Joe, Joe Kinosian, uh who does the score, who does the you know the musical score and the voices, really made Jerry Maguire his own. All right, writer to writer, producer to producer, I'd love to be a fly in the wall when you put these episodes together because I know for a fact there's no way you're just you know. All right, start at page one. We'll we'll get over here to page sixteen in a matter of moments. But what what really goes into the process of this? Because you do talk about the character voices, you do talk about the historic lessons. What what happens here in the studio? So, do you want to take this, Ben? I mean, so basically, I think early on, you know, we 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 had a couple episodes that we had written as straight historical podcast so you know i i had a real sense of like what the what the arc of every show would be like but then we had i had you know ben who's a, a phenomenal writer we had joe knozian who's a phenomenal writer and so we and we had you know um lacy roberts who's a one of the show's producers and two you know uh two other producers and and really what we what i tried to do is kind of set up this culture of never saying no yep so if, if somebody had an idea, I just always said yes and tried to work it in. Um, so that, you know, that, that was part of it. But yeah, we had like a, we had a writer's room. And so basically I would turn over a draft that had, you know, the, you know, your sort of traditional podcast arc to it with, you know, you know, hosts and experts mm -hmm. and spaces where these sort of, um, 
you know, we would have these intrusions from the characters that we we created would come in and we would just workshop them, you know, and we would do a couple drafts and we would do table reads and we would make changes in the table reads and then we would do another table read and make more changes. It was really, you know, it was it was really a process of, you know, creation and constant refinement. Um, you know, we would do a sort of a, a, a big final recording and then you know, after the recording, we would do more refining and, you know, <laughs> so yeah, it was, um, the show finding its voice and sort of becoming this very bizarre thing was, was not the hard part. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, once we figured out what it was, it really sort of, you know, the, the, the show itself kind of became the show itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. This it's, it's that kind of stuff that inspires those that like to bang out their podcast. Take another day, take another week off, and 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 put things <laughs> together because because you are really lifting journalism. You're also historians. You're archaeologists. You you are in touch, and and I just can't thank you guys enough for doing what you're doing. Thank you so much for your thank you so much for your time, and for anybody out there who wants to follow that wonderful observation, we can say. Uh, you know, try not to take several years to make it because <laughs> <laughs> we got in a rabbit hole. But thank you so much for these kind words. Yeah, like Alex said, this show just it means the world to us. Um, and we hope we hope more people tune in. If you are a fan of hidden history, if you are a fan of uh, tracing larger patterns in history or if you just like to laugh, uh, there there's some pretty solid jokes in there. So please tune in. Be brilliant. You too. OK, you too. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you so much.